Welcome back. So if you remember from last time, um, Dr. Weatherby and Avril had just broken out of the room that they were being held in. And meanwhile, back in Rushford um, at the, um, the school, they're about to put on a play and Augustus is the star. Okay, chapter 12 is called The Play's The Thing. Back in the Rutchford Town Library, Lionel rubbed his eyes, blew on his chilly hands, and stared at the computer screen. The clones were not going to be anywhere near as delighted as he had first thought. In fact, if he told them everything he had discovered about the man who had created them, they were going to be appalled. The articles told of malformed human embryos discovered in glass jars of strange cloned hands and feet locked away in dark corners of Leviticus. One particularly vivid article from a magazine called Stranger Than Fiction, to which Lionel now fully intended to start subscribing, wrote about the blood curdling screams that filled Leviticus late at night and about the air of evil that hung about Blute's shoulders like a vampire's cloak. One thing the articles all agreed upon was that Professor Blute had never been seen again. Some speculated that he was in hiding, some that he must be dead, while Stranger Than Fiction was adamant that he had been kidnapped by aliens. None of this was going to help the poor clones. Lionel turned to the last unused page in his notebook and entered the final website that had been listed. It was a lengthy piece on Gideon Blute's disappearance by some investigative journalist and contained too many tedious facts and figures for Lionel's liking. He scanned through the pages as quickly as he could. Then he saw something that made him stop. It was a photograph of a very glamorous and very familiar looking dark haired woman wearing a pair of sunglasses. The caption underneath the picture read, Serafina Seducta, international master spy and one of the most wanted criminals in the world. What does she know about Blute's whereabouts? The FBI, which almost caught up with Seducta last year, says its recordings of her phone calls reveal that she is in contact with the man calling himself Gideon Blute. She was the one who had rung his doorbell late last night. Lionel was scribbling in his notebook when a heavy hand on his shoulder made him jump out of his chair. You again, said the senior librarian. How long have you been in here? Didn't I ban you only last month? Lionel was confused. She never came into work until at least 9 a.m. Over her hefty shoulder, he could see just the clock on the wall, quarter to seven. It was quarter to seven in the evening. Lionel squirmed out of the librarian's grip, dived for the door and hurried out of the building. Thankfully, his car had not been towed away, though there was a pink slip folded underneath the windshield wipers. It was not a parking ticket, but what he read made Lionel's knees buckle slightly. St. Swithin's Primary School presents Philomena Dougal's brilliant and original theatrical work, The Cat and Dick Whittington, starring Augustus the dog as the cat. There was a nicely drawn picture of Augustus filling the bottom half. Lionel started the sputtering engine and executed a wild three-point turn before roaring back down the main street. Dr. Seductive had searched everywhere, abandoned houses, deserted alleys, anywhere three frightened clones might be hiding. She had even begun to question, question passers-by, disregarding secrecy. She could not tell the boss the clones were lost. Of all the people she had worked for, drug dealers, criminal masterminds, crooked politicians, Gideon Blute was the only one she was afraid of. She had no doubt about what happened to those who incurred his wrath. He made a point of taking all his new staff to see room 237, where he gave a well-rehearsed little speech that was now ringing in Dr. Seducta's ears. Only two kinds of people are allowed to see this room, those I can trust and those who are sent here. I do hope you remain in the first category. 
Dr. Seducta was desperate. She had overheard a supermarket checkout girl telling some customers about the extremely tall, red uniformed man who had pilfered 18 pounds and 71 pence worth of goods from the store that very morning. The clones were definitely in Retchford. She just didn't know where. Now it was getting dark again. Despite the freezing weather and her customary coolness, she was sweating. She was going to have to tell Gideon. She stopped outside the library and fumbled in her pocket for her cell phone with shaking hands. Suddenly, a giant poster on the library door cut her, caught her eye. The picture was what first held her attention, but the large writing made her move closer. Augustus the dog as the cat. Dr. Seducta dropped the phone back into her pocket. Excuse me, she purred at a passing policeman. Could you tell me the quickest way to St. Swithin's school? Uh-oh. As the audience gathered in the school hall, Eddie tried to remain calm. There was no sign of Lionel, and it looked as if they were going to have to go ahead with the play. Five minutes, Wilfred told Eddie, pushing the cardboard chariot into the wings. It was newly painted with three slapdash coats of gold paint and decorated with a smattering of plastic rubies. You'd better give Augustus his call. Eddie moved along to Augustus's dressing room. The rest of the cast had been herded into the bathrooms, leaving the dressing room solely for his use. And Bonaparte had pasted a cardboard star to the door. Eddie glared at it and went in without bothering to knock. Augustus was stretched out in his chaise lounge, digging into a takeout pizza. There was a half-eaten bunch of grapes on the floor and an enormous vase of fresh flowers on the windowsill. He was wearing a silk eye mask. Old boot-faced Dougal seemed to think I might like a pizza, he said, as Eddie pulled up a corner of the mask. Give me strength for the show. Augustus, you didn't speak to her. Of course not, he chewed a slice of pizza. We great actors need no words to communicate, you know. Look, Eddie struggled to control her temper. You'd better behave yourself, Augustus. Just stay quiet, ride around in your chariot, and get it all over with so we can get out of here. No funny business, got it? She stomped out and slammed the door shut just as a tuneless piano chord from Miss Dougal out front announced the opening song of the show. It's under control. Dr. Seducta was telling her cell phone as she slid along St. Swithin's Street and through the school's gates. I've tracked them down to a school, St. Swithin's. A school? They are out in public? This is most unsatisfactory. I'm on it, Professor. Dr. Seducta's smooth hair was starting to frizz slightly. She chewed a dark red talon. I'll bring them to you. No, thank you. You have already taken up quite enough of my time and patience already. Dr. Sedota almost whimpered. I will send Dr. Crump's clone. It will be able to take them away without raising their suspicions. You just keep an eye on them until it gets there. And for heaven's sake, do not draw attention to yourself or the non-viables in any way. Augustus's face stared down at Dr. Seducta from a sign saying, See Augustus the dog on stage for the first time. But if something does happen, Dr. Seducta tried to make her trembling voice sound casual. If the dog speaks, I hope you do not allow it to come to that, Serafina. But if it does, you know what to do. Dr. Seducta stared down at the silver ring on the fourth finger of her right hand with her thumb. She twisted it gently. In an emergency, in an emergency. Yikes, that's scary. Okay, chapter 13. My name is Mr. Dog. Lionel was out of breath when he arrived at St. Swithin's School Hall. He tried in vain to dredge up a morsel of oxygen, but the shock of seeing Bonaparte on stage was too much for him. Or, the clone was belly, bellowing happily, or. Where was Eddie? Lionel squinted through the darkness and scanned the rows of chairs, but there were no familiar faces, except for one. 
the dark-haired woman in sunglasses, slipping into a spare seat in the front row, staring intently up on the stage, her eyes fixed on Bonaparte. Lionel's racing heart almost stopped dead. And then a dreadful creaking announced the arrival of a tatty looking chariot. Augustus glared out the audience behind the bright lights. They had no appreciation of the finer points of his art, ignoramuses. Then he noticed something. Among the blue haired ladies and people in shabby hand-me-down clothes in the front row sat a woman who was truly classy. She dripped with distinction. Nobody wore sunglasses indoors unless they were truly important. She must be a West End producer who came to discover him. Augustus hopped out of the chariot and pranced forward, ready to dazzle the talent scout with, with his brilliance. Dr. Sedacto was on full alert. What was the wretched mutt about to do? Eyes bright, ears pricked, and paws aloft, he was taking a deep theatrical breath. Seducta remembered Gideon's instructions. She must silence the dog. Several things happened at once. Lionel saw a tiny dart fly from Seducta's ring. Watch out, he shouted. Augustus felt something whiz past his ear, and Bonaparte sprang to the front of the stage, pulling off his hat and waving a sheath of grubby papers. Ladies and gentlemen, his voice was trembling with anticipation. Allow me to present my contribution to this remarkable piece of theater. There was a bemused silence. The audience stared up at the extraordinary figure on the stage as he warbled a little too a little to find his starting note. In a fury, Dr. Seducta twisted off her silver tranquilizer ring. Blast! She spat at it as it rolled out of her hand and under her chair. The little girl seated behind her picked it up. Hands off, it's mine. The girl stuck out her tongue and handed the ring to her friend. Pass it on, she giggled. This song, said Bonaparte, is entitled, My Name is Mr. Dog. Dr. Sedecta leapt out of her seat and began to clamor over the rows of chairs, eyes fixed on the ring as it passed from hand to sweaty hand. Give that back, she screeched above Bonaparte singing. From the other side of the hall, Lionel saw exactly what was happening and began climbing over chairs himself, desperate to reach the ring before Dr. Seducta did. For yay, my name is Mr. Dog. Hooray, my name is Mr. Dog. I'll say my name is Mr. Dog. My name is Mr. Dog. Breathless with excitement, Bonaparte finished his first chorus, shading his eyes with a shaking hand he peered into the auditorium. Dust please thee, he called. Miss Dougal gurgled slightly. Then I shall continue. Bonaparte top, tapped his foot on the floor to reestablish his rhythm and started the second verse. Backstage, Eddie was frozen in shock. Wilfred tugged her sleeve. Eddie, your uncle, that's the worst song I've ever heard. Eddie dared to peep around the wings, where her eye was drawn to a disturbance out in the auditorium. To her astonishment, she could see Lionel lip, leaping unathletically across the lap of a bewildered grandmother six rows back. Lionel, I knew you'd come. She turned to Wilfred. You're absolutely right. We've got to stop him. She spotted the turnip basket. Pass me one of those turnips. Beginning the third verse, Bonaparte was striking a pose. He lowered his quivering voice to a dramatic whisper, oblivious to the commotion out front. Eddie took aim with the turnip, but her throw went wide and it rolled out into the audience. Dr. Seducta pounced on a freckled boy beside the middle aisle. Just as the ring reached his hands, Lionel dived wildly across two rows and managed to grab the boy by the pants leg. Give it to me, brat! Dr. Seducta twisted his ear. No, don't let her have it, Lionel gasped. Please. Alarmed, the boy let go of the ring. It tumbled onto the floor and spun down the aisle with Lionel and Dr. Seducta in hot pursuit. Bonaparte's performance finished with a flourish. He bounded over to Augustus. Dost thou wish to hear any part again? Good grief, said Augustus.
Luckily, the audience was too distracted by the fight that had broken out in, the, in its midst to realize that it was the dog who had just spoken. Lionel and Dr. Seducta both had a hold of the ring. Let go, Dr. Seducta was sweating as she struggled with the old man, trying to break his grip with wild karate chops. Never, Lionel almost pulled away from her, but she administered a harsh blow to his funny bone. Ow! The ring flew up in the air. Lionel and Dr. Seducta elbowed and shoved at each other, reaching out to the first to grab it as it spun down toward the ground. It was Lionel who got to the first touch, fumbling blindly with his fingertips to secure his catch. His thumb brushed against the firing mechanism, etched into the silver. A tiny tranquilizer dart shot out of the ring and met Dr. Seducta's right earlobe. She was unconscious even before she hit the floor, approximately one and a half seconds later. Shall I provide an encore? Bonaparte was still flushed with success. No! Miss Dougal sprang to her feet from the heap she had fallen into somewhere in the middle of the second verse. Not again! Bonaparte's face fell like a doomed elevator. Didst it displease thee? He lowered his sheets of paper and hung his head. Oh, I'm exceedingly sorry. Intermission, Miss Dougal cried as Bonaparte drooped his way out into the wings. A battered Lionel heaved himself up onto the stage as the audience began to head for the exit. He spotted the first dart where it had landed on the floor and put it carefully inside his handkerchief. Then he scooped Augustus up and went into the wings. You have been followed, he said, ushering Eddie toward a side door against which a sniffling Bonaparte was leaning. There's a woman in the audience. She tried to shoot you. Oh, rubbish, Augustus snapped. That woman was a top theatrical producer, not some common criminal. With this, Lionel held out the dart. Well, Augustus said, I'm sure she's a top theatrical producer in her spare time. We've got to get out of the here. Lionel opened the side door. Eddie, we'll wait. Wilfred was gazing at the four of them, astonished that a dog had just appeared to speak. What on earth is going on? Wilfred, I can't explain, Eddie said. I, I have to go. You can't. Eddie, come on, said Lionel, throwing a glance over his shoulder to check that Dr. Seducta was still unconscious. Eddie brushed off Lionel's hand and stared back at Wilfred. I don't want to go, she said. I just want to be normal. She did not know whether she was talking to Wilfred, Lionel, or herself, but it was Lionel who responded. But you're not normal, he said softly. You can't stay here. It's too dangerous. Eddie looked at the others. Bonaparte was blowing his nose on his sleeve and clutching his song sheets. Augustus was trying to get comfortable in Lionel's arms. I'm sorry. With tears in her eyes, Eddie turned back to Wilfred. I have to go with my family. Well, what's dangerous, Eddie? Tell me what's going on. You're my friend. Wilfred's voice rang after them as Lionel hurried the three clones through the door, almost drowning out Bonaparte's sobbing. I did but wish to honor Mr. Dog with a musical tribute. Did I do very wrong? Eddie was glad for the distraction. She was trying very hard not to cry herself. Well, it was kind of silly, Bonnie. He did but wish to honor me with a musical tribute, Augustus glared at her. Can you blame him? And I did also wish Mr. Shakespeare to be proud of me. Oh, Bony, Eddie said, that's very sweet. Although I have a sneaking suspicion that things got mixed up in the explosion, that you're more likely to have Shakespeare's bravery and Napoleon's writing skills. I know you wanted to please everyone and honor me with a musical tribute. But it might have put us in more danger. You told everyone the story of how we were created. Oh, please, said Augustus, as if anyone could make head or tail of that drivel. Bonaparte let out a howl. There's no time for recriminations now, Lionel said. Let's hurry. There could be more of them. At the far end of the hallway, a door opened. Don't move, Lionel hissed. We don't know who it is. 
Eddie reached for Bonaparte's hand and looked at Augustus's, still in Lionel's arm. Get ready to run, she whispered. Who are you? Lionel called. Identify yourself. The figure stopped. It reached out for a light switch. There's no need for that, it said cheerily. A light flicked on. I'm here now, children. I found you. Everything's going to be all right. The three clones stared. They spoke with one breath. Avril. Okay, we'll stop there for tonight. I hope you're enjoying this and we'll see you next time. Bye.